To begin, let me share some fantastic news with you. Some great news. Not just good news, some great news. God is working in your situation, through your situation, whatever it is, whether you see it or not. I mean, that's fantastic news, church. That regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of situations, because some here this morning, you've received some really good news. Quite frankly, things are going well and God's just been very present and he's working in the middle of what is a favorable time for you. And there are others. You received news last night, last month, last year. Something occurred, a relationship was broken, something happened, and you're devastated. You're at the other end of the situational spectrum. In fact, you're wondering, can it get any worse? God's work in situations is no respecter of situations. Listen to this great news, church, that in the middle of your situation, whatever it is and wherever on the spectrum it is, God is working, whether you see it or not. Now, here's what I hope is happening in your head right now. I hope you're thinking, that's a pretty bold assertion. In fact, Todd, it seems like you're speaking for God making claims for the Lord. Like, can you prove that? I would love to. Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17, prove this point beautifully. And they also prove this point ugly. So what do I mean? This section of scripture is, what I refer to as the tapestry passage. You could call it the cross stitch section of scripture. If you do anything in those fields, you'll know what I'm speaking of. The front is usually very nice and pretty, beautiful, good to look at, but you flip it over, what do you have? You've got a mess of thread and knots. It's hard to even make sense of the back, but look at the front. You're like, I like that. Look at the back. You're like, I don't get that. That's Matthew 1, 1 to 17. It's got a beautiful, perfect side and it's got an ugly, imperfect side. Can I show them to you just before we read the text? Matthew 1, 1, you see the name Jesus Christ in verse one? You should circle that. And then the name Messiah at the end of verse 17, circle that. That's the perfect, beautiful side, amen? And then what's between that, between verses two and 16, that's the ugly, imperfect side. Here's how I did it in my Bible. I'll show you a picture of it. I circled Jesus Christ and Messiah. I drew a straight line between the two. And then I circled each of the names once, to show me that this perfect one came through a line of incredibly imperfect people. <laughs> and my question is, how did God do that? That's our topic this morning. I hope we can discover the treasure that will emerge before us through this long list of names. We are going to read them all. Don't worry, you're just listening. I've got to say them, so relax, okay? Matthew chapter one, verses one to 17, this tapestry passage, as we prepare to read it, keep in mind, as you circle the names, as you've drawn the line, that what you're going to see in these verses, amazingly, is a line that includes 37 men, five women, 12 brothers who were involved in an intense sibling rivalry, an immigrant, a prostitute, a victim of sexual abuse, a boy who became king at eight, one who became king at 16, 
an adulteress, a murderer, Judah's most wicked king, and a pregnant teenage girl. And that's just a few of them. Follow along with me as I read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. An account of the genealogy, or you could say line, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And now he's going to walk us through those names. He's going to start with Abraham and go to David and then to Jesus. Look what he says. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. Aram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered King David. By the name King David, just write the number 14, would you? Good job. In verse 6, David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Rehoboam fathered Abijah. Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat fathered Joram. Joram fathered Uzziah. Uzziah fathered Jotham. Jotham fathered Ahaz. Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Out beside Josiah's name in verse 11, just write the number 14. Good job. Verse 12. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Sheatiel, Sheatiel fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Abiud. Abiud fathered Eliakim. Eliakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Akim. Akim fathered Eliud. Eliud fathered Eleazar. Eleazar fathered Matan. Matan fathered Jacob. And Jacob fathered Joseph, who, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the, say it with me, church, Messiah. Up beside the name Jesus, will you write the number 14? Good work. Let's read verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were, say it with me, church, 14 generations. And from David until the exile to Babylon, how many? 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, how many? 14 generations. I want to take what often we look at as just a long list of names that really makes no sense. I want to share with you some beautiful truths about the providence of God. I want to do that, first of all, poetically. Then I want to talk to you about it theologically. Those will be brief. I want to spend most of our time speaking about these verses and the truth of providence applicationally. So first of all, these 17 verses from a poetic point of view. There's a number that's used a lot in this section of Scripture. I'm going to take a chance. You know what that number is. Say it with me. 14. And maybe you're saying why. And Todd, surely there's more than that in the line here. There are. He doesn't list every single person. But what Matthew is doing is using a literary device in the Jewish culture to make a point. In other words, he's using numbers to make a point with words. In the Hebrew alphabet, often each letter would have a numerical significance. And so if you were to add up the letters of David's name, you would uh, come up with 14 based on the Jewish alphabet and how it's structured and its numerical significance. His point is to show this. David is the one that points to the Messiah meaning Jesus is truly the king of the Jews. And so he uses the number 14 multiple times. Watch this, not only to show that he is in the line of David and rightly king, but also, I believe, to show that he is the perfect, completed uh, work of God. he's, He's God's son, perfect, righteous, holy. In other words, God's 
plan is complete and perfect. It doesn't need amending or adjusted. It's fulfilled perfectly in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, see, I say that to you because seven in the Jewish system is really the number for God. It's a number indicating perfection. And Matthew, I think, doubles it to say it's doubly good. Now, you may think that sounds odd that Matthew would write in that way, but it's really not that odd in the Bible's culture. In fact, I think you're more familiar with this than you realize. Some of you are aware of the current craze regarding end times, the Antichrist. There's a number associated with the Antichrist. It's what? 666. That's the same literary device used in Revelation. The technical name for this device or this concept where numbers are used to prove a point or to teach a lesson is called gematria. Kind of a big $10 word. Just know it's what it's called. I want to share that with you so you'll know I'm not making this up, okay? And so in regards to the Antichrist, I personally believe he's part of the unholy trinity, which consists of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The beast is typically seen as the Antichrist. So I think the 666 is simply a numerical way to say here's the complete antithesis of God in every way. Here's the opposition to God seen in its highest form. The unholy trinity of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, 666. Man exponential on full display in rebellion against God. God's number would be 777 if he were to have one. Does that make sense? The Holy Trinity, God in three persons. One God, three persons. And so numbers were often used to indicate a truth. And I think what Matthew is saying to us, in a line full of imperfect people, here's the right king of the Jews perfectly completing God's plan. Isn't that beautiful? And that's just wonderful poetic use of language and numbers. So I think that's what's going on here poetically and the use of the number 14 several times. What's going on here theologically? Well, two words should flash across the screen of your mind. Jot these down in your journals, put them in your Bible. These two words are sovereignty and providence. Can you say them with me? Sovereignty and providence. Now they're different and yet they're very similar. Um, I'll say more about this on the podcast Tuesday, so I won't give it away here, except to say this. I tend to think, and I admit, I admit to you, this is a hair-splitting difference. I mean, we're really cutting it thin here, okay? Sovereignty is more about who God is. Providence is more about what God does, Again, I'll say more Tuesday. Check out the Extra Point podcast. I think you'll appreciate these two words more. When I read these 17 verses, because they deal with the interaction of God with man and the events of the earth, I think the one word of these two that should really take center stage is the word providence. This is the word that really just oozes out of every single paragraph. The providence of God. And maybe you're wondering, What is providence, Todd? Providence is really God's involvement in his creation. Now, I'll give you a much longer definition Tuesday. I'll walk you through that, unpack it for you. Just know this, that essentially and succinctly, it's God's involvement in his creation. Remember, we're not deists, we're theists. We know that God created all things, and by virtue of that creation, he he interacts with his creation, wants to know us. He's near, close, he's not distant and far. He's high and lifted up, but he's also intimately close and personal. So this is providence, the truth that God intervenes, that God interacts, that he is engaged with his creation. Watch this, that in every situation, God is working. That's providence. Now, As you think about these words theologically, be aware that that providence is often hard to spot. We'll use the word subtle. 
And providence is often slow. If it weren't subtle and slow, we would call it a miracle, right? Those are clear and quick and to the point. A man is healed. Someone's raised from the dead. But providence, quite frankly, speaks to that work of God in every situation that is usually slow and subtle, which is why we often don't think God is working in our situations. But don't forget the great news that Matthew 1 is going to show us that God is working in every situation, whether you see it or not. So that brings me to try to help us understand some things from these verses applicationally. We've seen the poetic aspect, the theological aspect, but let's spend most of our time applicationally. Like, what do these verses say to us about providence? What can we draw from this section of scripture regarding this theological doctrine, this concept? Two observations. Here's the first one. God's providence specializes in the least of these. I'd say to you that most of these people in this uh, section, these three paragraphs, are not famous they didn't earn a spot there. They weren't your superstars. They weren't your first round draft picks. Can I show you three of them? In the line of Christ, people God used to bring forth the perfect and yet who really were just unknowns. You'll be surprised at this because you, you know them. But if you lived in that time, if you were in that culture, you would not have known them. You would have been shocked to hear, hey, in, in a few thousand years, they're going to be mentioned in the Bible in the line of Christ. You're like, no way, not her, not him. First one's Ruth. You see Ruth's mention there? Chapter 1, verse 5. Keep in mind, Ruth was a foreigner, married a man who died. That man's brother also died. So there were these two sister-in-laws who were accompanying a widow back to Bethlehem during a famine. Like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. Only one sister stayed with the mother-in-law. So they're making their way back to Bethlehem. The, the mother-in-law is pretty bitter. Three deaths, you can see why perhaps, at least from a human perspective. And Ruth is the one who maintains loyalty and commitment and goes to Bethlehem and, and just really enters into like some low wage kind of work. She's kind of scrapping for food, to be honest with you. I mean, nobody really knows who she is. And yet uh, here she is now being used by God to make sure that the line of Christ continues and Jesus is born. A foreign woman who was trying to survive a famine and was also a widow. Look at another one. It's David. And you don't think about David in this way because most of us do this. We think of David from Goliath forward. Like, man, I want to be like David. You don't think about David from Goliath backwards. You realize that David, when Samuel was there to anoint the king, he wasn't even in the household. Like we talk about like, hey, who, who's the last to get picked on the playground? David wasn't even on the playground. He was not even present. Samuel works through the line and he's like, something's not right. None of these men are to be the next king. So he says to the father, Jesse, like, hey, and, and I love the tone of the text there. He's like, is there, is, there, is there somebody missing? Is there anybody else, Jesse? Like, uh, what are, uh, who's hiding? You know, it's kind of like, uh, come on, man, give me some help here. And, and then Jesse's response is this, like, well, I got this younger kid. He's out with the sheep, like, the, the, the sense is like, I know it's not him, but I'll tell you about him anyway. That's kind of what you get, right? David comes in and that's God's anointed next king. See, we love to think about Goliath Ford. David was an afterthought. The one who would really be the prototype for the ultimate King Jesus wasn't even in the room when the negotiation started. Notice one more. It's Josiah. 
How many in here are eight years old? Raise your hand. We got our kids with us this week. If you're eight, would you raise your hand? Any eight-year-olds in the room? I'm looking around. Okay, some eight-year-olds. I'll call it third grade. This is how old Josiah was when he became king. Now, you may think, well, that's just the way it worked, Todd, in the monarchy. But consider this. What if we said, you know what? We're looking for some help on the elder team, so we're going to go to the third grade class, and we're going to ask a few third graders to come in here and oversee the elders and work things out for our church. You would do what you're doing now. You'd laugh. It's not normally what we do. We don't appeal to the third graders to run a country. So, so watch this. In the line of Christ, there's a foreign woman, an afterthought, and a third grader. And yet God used them to ensure the perfect one arrived in the fullness of time. Hallelujah, church. Aren't you glad that God uses the least of these? Can we just put that in a sense that we understand? Aren't you glad that God uses the least of us? (laughs) See, that's where we fit. We're not the celebrities, the famous ones. If I can just be very vulnerable with you and, and really kind of to the point, God's not looking to use a stage or a platform. He's not worried about your brand. God wants the faithful individual who could care less what the world thinks, but who says, I'll be faithful to God. If no one ever knows me, I'm good with that. God knows me. That's the least of these that God will use. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm I'm feeling right at home in that kind of culture, aren't you? As I think about these names, my mind runs to one name that you've probably never heard of. It's tied to a name many of you have heard of, though. I'll give you the first name. Edward Kimball. I doubt very few here know who Edward Kimball is, but a lot of you will know about D.L. Moody. Now, some of our younger crowd may not, but D.L. Moody was a famous pastor, evangelist. He preached worldwide. Um, It's estimated he preached to 100 million people before he passed away. He also has a school in his honor, Moody Bible Institute, thriving and doing well, training uh, those for missionary service and the pastorate especially. So while you've heard of D.L. Moody and many things associated with him, most of us haven't heard of Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was the customer in the shoe store that D.L. Moody worked in as a teenager. And when Edward Kimball walked in that day, he was in the stock room and he saw D.L. Moody and he shared his faith with him. Edward Kimball was a simple Sunday school teacher. He may have invited him to his class. Maybe they were interacting about that, but he shared his faith with him. History tells us that weeks later, Moody consecrated his life to Christ in repentance and faith. And the rest of the story is beautiful, isn't it? We love what we hear about D.L. Moody, but I thank God for Edward Kimball, the customer who just was looking to buy some shoes. Like that sounds like us, doesn't it? Who should you be witnessing to and talking to, conversing with, that maybe they'll never know your name, but they'll know his name or her name. I'm content with that. The work of God moves forward. The kingdom of God's advancing. You leave my name off of it. Leave your name off of it. That's the kind of mentality that really is attractive. The least of these. By the way, um, speaking of D.L. Moody, you know, you can trace the line from D.L. Moody to Billy Graham. Uh, I won't do the whole thing here, but essentially, uh, Billy, uh, D.L. Moody eventually um, uh, impacted a man named J. Wilbur Chapman, kind of a famous evangelist and pastor. And then he had a real impact on some men and one of those in the surroundings with regards to Billy Sunday, who was born in Ames, I believe. And through Billy Sunday's ministry of itinerant evangelism, a man came to Christ named Mordecai Ham. That's a name, isn't it? Mordecai Ham, what a name. Mordecai Ham was preaching when Billy Graham became a Christian. So we love those names. D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, but 
Can't we together thank God for the Edward Kimballs? Amen, church? And this is what providence does. Providence specializes in using the unknown, the least, the unheard of, not famous, the uncelebrities, people just like you and me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 echoes this very thought from Matthew 1. Let me read it for you and just let this wash over you. Paul says this, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective. Not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Do you see the upside down nature of God's work? The counterintuitive nature of how he gets things done in every situation? God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. And why does God do this? So that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him, speaking of God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here's what we need more of. People who aren't worried about their name, they're worried about God's name. That's the least of these. That's that mentality and attitude that God will use providentially for his purposes. Notice the second thing that God does with providence. He specializes in the worst of these. Now, I'll be frank with you. This is going to get a little, can I say the word raw? It's going to get just a tad intense because there are some very vile situations referenced in these 17 verses. I'll be tactful. We have kids in the room. I understand all that. But parents, be aware, and all of us be aware. There's no way to read these verses and come out squeaky clean. Let me give you a sampling of the horrendous wickedness that took place, instigated by the evil one to try to stop the line of Christ. Several times, he just would perpetuate um, uh, incredible uh, evil and terrible things. And yet God in his majesty and sovereign providence always worked it to accomplish his end goal, the coming of Christ. Let me give you a few of these. First of all, notice if you would, Judah. He's mentioned there in verse uh, three. Fourth son. He's the line through which Christ came. And yet Judah is an interesting character. He was involved in the plot to kill his brother. Like you might see that like in 48 hours or something, right? And yet we find Judah doing this really odd thing. As soon as they said, let's kill our brother, he said, well, let's don't, let's don't kill him. Let's just sell him. So I'm not going to do murder. I'll just get into trafficking. I mean, Judah's kind of an odd character. Like he's trying to be the righteous one at the, at the last moment, right? You find the same thing when he, commits adultery and fornication with his daughter-in-law who was masking as a prostitute. There's a long story there, Genesis 37 and 38 laid out for you. Well, she becomes pregnant, has twins. He was about to put her to death, but when she reveals that he's the father, he says, well, you're more right than me. So it's like Judah has these incredibly wicked moments. And at times he seems remorseful. He's in the line of Christ. It's jaw dropping. It's flabbergasting. Notice another one, Rahab. Her story is found in Joshua chapter two. She was a prostitute. She's the one who welcomed the spies and then hid them and in the end of the day, she and her family were saved because she repented and believed that the God of Israel was the only true God. 
I heard Brett speak on this a few weeks back to our youth group, I think the middle schoolers mainly, and uh, he described her profession of faith in which she says to the spies, we've heard of your God. And she lays out her belief and essentially that moment says, I'm, I'm renouncing all these idols and my lifestyle. I'm embracing Yahweh and believe. And they tell her to lay the cord out the window. She does as a sign of her faith. And sure enough, Jericho falls and she is saved and a prostitute and her family join the family of God. Amen. Aren't you glad that there's no sin bigger than God's grace? Look at another one. It's Solomon. You may think that's an odd name to throw into the worst of these categories, but I will tell you, while he was Israel's most wealthy king and the kingdom flourished most under Solomon, he was also Israel's, um, one of Israel's uh, dark spots as he led the nation at the end to an immense amount of treaties with other nations. And with that came a number of wives and concubines. The Bible says he had a 700 wives and a thousand concubines. So he had unrestrained sexual appetites and unrestrained political power appetites. And it detracted him and distracted him from following God wholeheartedly. And the nation suffered so much that there was no real baton passing, his two sons split the kingdom. Solomon's uncontrollable appetites affected an entire nation. And yet, he's in the line of Christ. Notice one more. It's Manasseh, probably one you've not heard much about. Manasseh is considered Judah's most violent and wicked king. Here's why. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles 33 or 2 Kings 21. Here's why. He committed genocide among his own people countrywide. But he went throughout the land and slaughtered his own countrymen. So these are people in the line of Christ, I believe personally, the arch enemy Satan trying to subvert it and corrupt it so that Christ isn't born. And in the middle of all of this incredible evil, what does God do? He providentially brings forth the perfect one, Jesus Christ. Even in the worst of situations and with the worst of people. When I think about these examples, and there's more than just those three or four, my mind goes to some current examples. No, they're not in the Bible, but they're folks I've met recently who have a similar story. It's quite amazing how the Lord has interacted me with them just recently, just to continue to drive this home point to me. Uh, maybe eight, nine months ago, I met a lady named Kathy Barnett. Kathy Barnett, I met her at the um, annual... Iowa prayer breakfast. Kathy's the one who uh, worked it out for me to go to the first Republican presidential debate in Milwaukee. We became friends to some degree and offered me tickets. I took them. I, I liked the political kind of environment. So I went. When I met Kathy, though, we were talking and I just asked her, I said, well, what's your story? Kathy, why are you here? And she's, well, I'm from Alabama. I'm here just kind of working the ground and you know, looking for contacts. And I said, oh, Alabama. I said, I'm from the South. I grew up in Tennessee. And she goes, well, I grew up in Alabama and my mother was young. My mother was 12. So I said, Kathy, you got to finish that story. She goes, yeah, my mom was raped when she was 12. And she was ready to get, have an abortion. And her family and community and church said, don't do this. We'll help you. And she didn't. She said, Todd, she gave birth, and I'm that child. Praise God. Amen. Kathy says, if anyone should believe in the sovereignty of God and his providential power, I do. And I said, I'm with you, girl. Amen. 
Kathy and I text off and on. She's a beautiful example of the sovereign providence of God. He intervened in what was a horrible evil and brought about something beautifully good. I'm reminded of a gentleman I talked with just two weeks ago in my office, Pastor Vitali. I mentioned him on our podcast, I think a week or two ago. So three of you have probably heard this before. I'll go ahead and repeat it anyway. Um, Pastor Vitali is from the Ukraine and his family has fled and now they're living here in America for a few months. He's headed back in December. His wife and daughter, she's in school. Um, I think it's Emory or something like that in the South in Atlanta. Um, a lot of PTSD they're having from this whole situation, having to flee so quickly. But he was telling me about just the incredible uh, situation in Ukraine. He said, I'm in the second largest city and I'm watching entire housing units just crumble. He showed me video footage of rockets and missiles hitting the buildings and them falling. He pointed his church at it and said, see that building? That's our church. He said, it's never been hit. He said, when a lot of these houses fell, uh, about 200 Christian Ukrainians came to live at our church. And he said, for over seven months, they lived in our basement of the church. Now, I don't know how that works. Like food, sanitation, accommodation, it's beyond me. But he said, Todd, we had no choice. They had nothing. So we just holed up in the basement. He said, eventually, they and about... Seven million other Ukrainians left and fled as refugees. He said, out of that number of Ukrainians, many were Christian. And he said, Todd, because of what I do there in Ukraine as a pastor and as I work with many churches, he said, I've got identifiable places in other countries now of 83 new churches. And then he looked at me and said this. He, he had a smile on his face. He said, Todd, we've been blessed with our own Acts 8-1. Like, I'm not smiling. I'm like, man, that's rough. That's tough. He goes, we've got our own Acts 8-1. We were forced to disperse. And look what God did. 83 new churches in other countries. Like, that's, that's horrendous evil that God used to bring about something incredibly and eternally good. So, so do you see what's happening not only is it true, biblically, historically, we're seeing even currently, God is providential. He uses the least of these and he uses the worst of these to make sure history gets to its intended purpose. In this moment, it was the birth of Christ. And based on Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and 1.17, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came in spite of verses two through 16, amen? God would say to you, no, because of two through 16. That's how powerful and sovereign he is. He's working in and through every situation, whether you see it or not. And regardless of where it falls on the spectrum, that's our powerful, sovereign, providential God. Reading about... The worst of these makes me think of Genesis 5.20. Excuse me, Genesis 50.20. In fact, will you read this one with me? We're about to wrap this up and land the plane. Read this verse with me, would you? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. And do not overlook this verse. This is Joseph in front of his brothers who about 15 years prior to this, approximately, they were trying to kill him. Judah's in this group. And he says, you meant it for evil. You planned evil, but God planned it for good. He doesn't say God worked it out in a sense like, well, now I've got this tough situation. I've got to try to remedy. God's not operating on like a, you know, a last minute schedule. Joseph says here, God knew all along. This is how God works. He providentially uses both good and bad to accomplish his purposes. That's a powerful God. And he can and does do this in every one of your situations. So I realize that you could have one of two reactions at this point. You can say, well, with a line that flawed, I'm out. I don't believe it. There's no way that a perfect savior could come 
through a line, uh, you know, that polluted. You can take that ramp, that exit. I know people who have. Here's a better option. He must be a powerful God to accomplish his will in those situations. <laughs> Here's historical proof that God's will is always done. That he is the victor. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And if you're going to trust any savior, trust Jesus Christ, the Messiah, whom God brought forth in the fullness of time through a host of the least of these and the worst of these. That's a powerful providential God. Leads me to say this to you in summary. This simple truth about providence that I want us to kind of latch on to. Providence is our treasure. Each week of Advent, we're going to kind of bring to your attention one treasure that you'll take home. So instead of a take-home truth, we're going to call it a take-home what? Treasure. So dwell on this. Think about it all week. This week, the treasure is providence, the doctrine, the concept. And here's a good sentence about providence you can kind of chew on for a bit. That God is always working in the ordeals, both visibly and invisibly, to accomplish his ideal. And I want to root this text, this statement in the text, because the ideal is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Right, church? The perfect one. The completion. But wouldn't you say with me that there is a whole lot of ordeals going on in this section? <laughs> That's providence. God bringing his ideal even through our ordeals. I thank the Lord for his providence. I've got some terrible ordeals I still deal with. I bet you do too. Things I wish I could undo, things I wish I could unsay, things I wish I could unsee. I've got scars baggage. I try to pack it well, but like you, I don't have a perfect record. You don't either. Aren't you glad God's not looking for a perfect record? He's looking for a repentant heart and willing feet and hands who will just follow. And when they fall, they'll get back up and they'll follow again. And when they fall, they'll get back up and they'll follow again. And they'll trust the providential God who's working in every situation. You see, this kind of truth can tempt us to do something that I think I need to make sure I address, and that is this, this obvious, hilarious thought that may have come to your head. It came to mind this past week. Like, if this is true, I should just create some more predicaments, and I should go and try to create some more ordeals because that seems to be what God really does well. So I'll go create a bunch more ordeals. No, this text, this passage, this truth isn't given to prod us to sin. It's given to prod us to faith. You see, that's always your first response to the providence of God. It must be, I trust you. Because we admit we can't always see how he's working. We don't always know how he's working it's sometimes slow and subtle. So we have to say, God, I know that you operate this way. So I trust that you're working. I trust you. I'll simply take the next right step. I'll obey. I'll follow. That's the one who sees the work of God, sees the hand of God. And over a long time, usually, and in a very subtle way, begins to realize, oh, so this is what God is doing. I just want to assure you this morning, God is working. Proof? The line of Christ. He's working in every situation. He's working through every situation, regardless of where it falls on the spectrum. That's the providential God who rules the universe. One last verse to close with. Read this with me, would you? 
This is the promise we bank on. But it just repeats what we've seen in so many passages. Here's the providence of, providence of God from Romans 8. Say it, church, with me. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who were called according to His purpose. And God is moving every bit of history and every bit of your life as a follower of Christ to His desired end game. He can because He's sovereign, and He does because He's providential. I'm praying you will trust and have faith in God this morning as he providentially works in every one of your situations.